David, it's great to connect with you. You have a new project. It's the Global Christian Relief Violent Incidents Database, and this is really unique. It's the first of its kind when it comes to monitoring persecution. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, of course, uh, I've been part of these kinds of studies before where you have a study of a persecution against Christians, and then there are other groups that study their particular uh, part of the piece of the pie. What I'm concerned about is a couple of things. First of all, there's this enormous growth in religious persecution, be it the persecution of Christians, which is the largest minority group as far as numbers that's, that faces severe persecution, or if it's uh, anti-Semitism, all of these kinds of markers around the world, you realize that the freedom to practice your faith, which is pretty fundamental, we're really talking about what do you have the ability to believe in your mind? What set of, of religious practices can you, can you put your trust in? What sacred texts are you allowed to read and believe in and practice your faith peacefully? It's what's going on between your ears and the governments and dictators and extremists want to control that. So that is growing across the world and everybody is segmented into their own particular thing. So the Christian persecution, we're talking about that. That's my particular point of interest. But how are Christians compared to other groups? In, let's say, China, where you have a large group of Christians, but you have a smaller group of Uyghurs, but the Uyghurs are exceptionally persecuted. They're able to round them up, put them in concentration camps, use forced sterilization. What that tells you is, it tells you something. First of all, if they were able to round up Christians and sterilize us and force us, they probably would do it. But there isn't 5 million of us. There's 100 million of us in China. And so these kind of comparisons help us not only with the freedom of religious expression, but also to be able to determine how we can best support the church, because I'm a follower of Jesus, and I want to support the church, the persecuted believers, wherever they may be, to practice their faith, to worship Jesus, to read their Bible in peace, civilly, within whatever country and context they're in. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, it's incredibly important to be aware of these incidents. Often we see headlines. I report on a lot of these events that happen, these one-offs, but having a database, a place where people can go to actually search and see what is happening. What are these violent incidents? Where are they happening? How do you go about, I think this is probably more of a, of a structural question, but it's an interesting one, gathering that information for the database? What, what goes into that process? Well, the numbers, you have to know, as with all these sort of things, it's not exhaustive in the sense that you're going to have every incident. What we've done here is worked with the Institute for International Religious Freedom, and, the, and we have researchers and, and academics who are looking across the database of incidents that can be proven that are, that are sort of verified in the public sphere. And obviously then you have networks of people within the countries that are reporting incidents. So that when we talk about violence, in this case, this release is about the violent indexes around the world, places where people have been abducted, churches have been bombed or closed, that uh, people have been killed specifically for their faith. You're, you're really talking about a baseline. Let me give you an example. One of the things we talk about is how many uh, Christians or others for their faith were displaced simply because of the, from their homes. They were driven out of their homes. There was a riot or the people attacked their homes. In India, over 62,000 people, we have 62,255 individuals that would fill a stadium, were driven out of their homes. They were homeless now because Hindu mobs attacked their their house, their village, their, 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 their place where they live, and they've lost everything just in India alone, just Christians. And there's 200 million Muslims that have been attacked, uh, that are under threat anyway in India as well. So we, this, is, this is how you, you sort of can get an idea of the scope of the problem. Now, why does this matter? It matters because here in the West, uh, the church is largely unaware of what's happening. And if they are aware of it, they're not able to index and sort of see as compared to what else. It, if you hear about uh, a, a journalist, for example, if a journalist is uh, killed in, in a situation where they're trying to report truthfully on what's happening, other journalists 
will let you know like this is what happened because there's a code between journalists that we're not going to let even one journalist be be imprisoned or killed for trying to be part of the free press that's a code within their thing and that's journalism very important but here we are in the kingdom of what we believe if you're a believer is an eternal idea and we're just sort of like everybody for themselves no, it's not right. So we need to wake up on this subject and know that we are called to pray for, care for, support uh, people who are persecuted for the name of Jesus, imprisoned for the name of Jesus, abducted for the name of Jesus, and everything else. You know, when when you look at this, you know, database, when you look ahead five years, ten years, you know, even one year, how do you see this being a tool that is beneficial that can be used to sort of not only help alleviate persecution, but maybe wake people up to what you just described? Well, I'm hoping it's going to take down barriers between people who want to have freedom of religious expression so that uh, Jews around the world and uh, everybody else uh, of any other faith that wants to have the free practice of belief freedom of belief, we'll be able to look and say like, wow, okay, this, I can see that it's not just us, it's happening to others as well. We need to stand up for this freedom. Um, and I'm hoping it'll have some sort of uh, ability to bring us together across different experience, life experiences and so forth. I do want uh, the church, um, because my concern is for my family and and I mean that in a spiritual family, I want the church to awaken. The database is going to grow better over time, and there'll be other ways that we can segment it, and we'll, we'll have other releases as this data comes online. But it's going to grow deeper over time, and you'll begin to see more of the trends, how things are changing. And, and really, I think this has policy implications for governments. It certainly has implications for how we look at our own lives in a practical sense as well. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And you know, you've been on the forefront of looking at these issues of persecution for a very long time now. And a number of nations, you brought up a couple, um, have such severe persecution issues. One of those nations is Nigeria. Once again, the U.S. State Department has declined to give the designation of countries of particular concern to have Nigeria on that list. What was your reaction I mean, this has happened again and again now. It was put on briefly by the Trump administration. The Biden administration took Nigeria off. But what was your reaction to, again, this year, seeing that it was not included? Well, it, I've had conversations with people in the State Department at the highest levels. I, I am both personally heartbroken that they failed to designate Nigeria as a country of particular concern because I know the impact that this is going to have as Nigeria feels like they, the country of Nigeria feels like they now have a pass that they can continue to overlook. And in some cases, we believe that the government or the military itself in some areas is helping the terrorists to attack these churches. So I'm heartbroken about it. I also feel, I, I have to tell you, as a matter of policy, I think now is the time for people who work in this field of religious freedom, who care about persecution of Christians and anti-Semitism and all these kinds of subjects, to really escalate this conversation. I think there needs to be congressional hearings on how these decisions are made because it's inexplicable with the attacks on Christmas Eve and then days later, hundreds of Christians slaughtered. Thousand, seven thousand, two hundred and three hundred and twenty-one believers were killed in this violence index reporting period. Seven thousand. Wow. And, and, more. and, and, and what do you? So congressional hearings. The other thing I would say, Billy, is uh, I think it's time we file Freedom of Information Act uh, requests to find out. It will take time, but obviously, but we need to know how was this decision made. What politics were played? What parties uh, were inv in involved in this decision making? Because it's, it's troubling. No, absolutely. And, and I think one of the big questions that is, that is so perplexing is what you're trying to get at there, the why, right? Everybody's sort of asking why. Why would you repeatedly not put Nigeria on? Especially, you know, it becomes less trouble. I mean, it's still troubling, somewhat less troubling if it were never put on, but the fact that it was put on and then taken off, you know, taken off of that designation, that creates more questions. You know, I know it's speculation, but why do you think, what are the reasons you think this is a nation that is not being put on this designation list? 
I, I think there's a lot of industry, money, uh, weapons, uh, geopolitics involved in these discussions. And the feeling is, uh, I think there's also some fear and lack of understanding around religious issues and, and under, lack of understanding of theology. Theology is the, the set of ideas that drive decisions for Boko Haram, for Islamic militants. They have spiritual and religious dogma that is helping them to come to conclusions about who is an infidel, who they should attack. And the State Department and their crisis planning is ignoring all of that. They literally are saying, well, this is about territory. It's about global warming. It's about thugs. And, and, all, and all of those factors exist within this kind of evil, for sure. There's money and there's issues and there's territory, but there's theology and a dogma that's driving their decisions. So if you can't acknowledge that, you will be a step behind. But let me talk about the positive side. If we were able to have a designation of a country of particular concern, we've seen it happen in Uzbekistan and Vietnam before, where the, there's a toolkit. If you designate a country of particular concern like Nigeria, the government then has a right to sanction and do certain things that will force the government to make some headway or just ignore or like say, we don't want to do business with the Western world. Let's keep terrorizing these Christians and, and, and moderate Muslims in these regions. Millions of them have been exposed to this. Uh, if we were to do that, you'd see like Vietnam, where there's been incremental improvement because Vietnam as a government wants to do business in the international community, and it's seen some improvements. There's still major issues in some of these rural areas, but fundamentally their posture has changed because of these designations. So it can work. I have no idea. It does not make any sense to me why they have not done this. Yeah, I mean, to your point, you know, if you're not acknowledging the real root of what's driving the evil desires and actions of groups of people, and you're attributing it to all different things that are sort of symptoms or, or maybe parts of that, but not the real core, that puts you at a real disadvantage of being able to actually solve that issue because you're not acknowledging the real cause. And so um, it would seem it would benefit everybody, you know, both in Nigeria and in our country as well and, and across the globe to be taking this seriously and really calling out these, these things for what they are. Uh, where can people go to find out more about Global Christian Relief and the wonderful work that you do? Globalchristianrelief.org. I would encourage you, watch the stories, watch the impact of what's going on around the world and how you can make a difference on an individual level. People can share stories and stories connect us with the real brothers and sisters, our family and the faith and what's happening to them, whether it's Nigeria, India, Vietnam, any of these places, China, we've talked about. I, I really do believe uh, that, that God is trying to stir his people on this issue. We are going to have a rising tide of intolerance and persecution here in the West. Would you like to know individual believer, how you can respond in a God-honoring way in the midst of persecution. Watch these stories. Share them. It's going to transform your faith, and I think it has an impact on what happens in the rest of the world as well. That, that's beautifully said. It gives a real example of how to deal with things that very well, to different degrees, could be coming you know, in, into the West and into this country as well. And it's also inspirational to see people who are suffering in so many ways, cling to their faith and to God. Um, I would imagine in your work, that has been something that's truly inspired your faith. Yeah, that's the thing that keeps me going. It's just the, the getting to know these people, hearing their stories and hearing them in the midst of things I would never wish upon anybody. They're experiencing the depth of pain. God is still there and he's enough, even when there's uh, just the toughest of circumstances. It's inspiring. That is a... That is a beautiful place to close. God is enough. As always, really appreciate your time today. Thank you.